。何が起こっているのか、ジョーのオタクショーへようこそ。漫画を語るビデオシリーズ。そしてこのビデオでは、ウルトラマンが、ユイトラマンボリューム1の台頭について話します。Ultraman, The Rise of Ultraman, Trade Paperback, Volume 1. And this book is written by Kyle Higgins and Mac Room, with art by Francesco Mana, colors by Espen g r u n d e j e r n and letters by VCs Ariana m e r r And this book centers around Shin Hayata, a young man interested in getting into the United Science Patrol after he and his childhood friend Kiki Fuji. Who became a member of the USP, witness a monster attack, and are saved by the secret organization, whose goal is to track interdimensional creatures called kaiju, and use devices known as K rays to seemingly disintegrate them. During a mission, Shin intervenes and saves Kiki, much to the dismay of Kiki's supervisor, Captain Toshio Muramatsu. Following these events, a UFO enters Earth's atmosphere and is shot down by a USP cannon, which the three head to check out and discover a large alien being emerging from the ship. Under pressure from Captain Muramatsu, Shin blasts the alien, but quickly realizes it's not hostile and approaches where the two touch, in which Shin is then enveloped in its energy. This leads to Shin being told of an impending kaiju calamity and agrees to bond to the alien entity, known as an Ultra, on the condition that he's in control of his own body. This journey leads both Miramatsu and Kiki to begin questioning the intentions of the USP, wanting to speak with the creator of the USP cannon that shot the Ultra ship down, resulting in the USP's pursuit and capture of Miramatsu. While Kiki ends up making it to the home of Dr. Yamamoto when they're attacked by another kaiju. Shin awakens back at the USP base and is introduced to the director of the Japanese division, Ueiro Ichitani, and through him speaks to Muramatsu and amasses Kiki's location. Shin, however, is not forthcoming to Ichitani as she had been branded a traitor by the organization, and Shin wishes to get her side of the story first. Shin then heads to Kiki with Ichitani following along, and it's here that Shin makes his first transformation into Ultraman, but is warned that the transformation will only last three minutes due to their link being weak because of the damage the Ultra suffered in both the crash and the shot from Shin. Ultraman succeeds in dispatching the monster and returns to human form only for Dr. Yamamoto to zap Kiki with a K ray. Shin takes the doctor back to Ichitani, where he learns that Yamamoto was a deserter of the USP, and then tells Shin the truth about the USP and K Ray. Because not only do the K Rays not kill Kaiju, but rather send them to a different dimension that is in danger of exploding due to overcrowding, and will cause planetary damage from the energy output, but also that the USP was aware of this. Pushing this discussion to the side for now, they quickly come up with a plan to rescue Kiki, which Shin enters the kaiju dimension as Ultraman and gets Kiki back to Earth. Unfortunately, a kaiju by the name of b e m u l l e r managed to slip through the cracks, and Ultraman increases his size to match the height of the creature. The two engage in a tough battle, resulting in the general public discovering the existence of kaiju and Ultraman, who, after some quick thinking, Wraps b e m u l l e r in the bridge cables and manages to destroy the monster. The book wraps up with Shin convincing Kiki and Ichitani to get ahead of the kaiju dimension explosion by letting him destroy it, which will release all of the kaiju but avoid the damage from the explosion. The idea then becomes a reality with the book ending with the reveal that Dan Moraboshi, a pilot who went missing in 1966 during a similar event that led to Shin's encounter with the Ultra, is alive, well, and the same age. And if I could sum this book up in two words, pure epicness. Because, man, I'll say both Kyle Higgins and Matt Groom craft an interesting story that feels like Ultraman. This book doesn't seem to Americanize Ultraman in the slightest or adapt it in any kind of way for an American audience. Everything, including locations, Ultraman himself, creature designs, Even moves like Ultraman's Spacian Beam are all kept very traditional. Anyone familiar and a fan of the Ultraman property should be able to pick up this book and feel right at home. And I'm not sure whether it's more Kyle Higgins, more Matt Groom, or if both are just fanboys of Ultraman and Tokusatsu properties in general, because this book flexes some decent knowledge and Easter eggs from the Ultraman TV series. For one, we've got a modernized version of Shin Hayata, who was the original Ultraman in the first series. 
The book starts out in 1966, and 1966 was the year Ultraman first aired on Japanese television. And you've got other characters like Dan Moroboshi popping up, who is actually the second Ultraman in the Ultra 7 TV series. Tons of little Easter eggs and history just strewn about the book. When it comes to the characters, I think they're all quite well done. I find Shin to be a great protagonist. He provides some comic relief, yet he has this upstanding moral compass for always wanting to do good. His friend Kiki is also likable and headstrong and knows when to follow orders and when to question authority when something seems off. The ultra that Shin bonds with is very direct and puts Shin in these really funny conversational moments where it's like the ultra's talking to Shin, but here's the thing, Shin is the only one that can see and hear the ultra. And then when you have our three main USP guys with Toshio Miramatsu, Ureru Ichitani, and Dr. Yamamoto. And these three guys seem to have the same kind of thing going on where we don't get in depth with their characters as much as say Kiki and Shin, as their primary function in this book is to be the keepers of knowledge and exposition. But one thing that I do like about these three is that they're all distinguishable from each other. And in a way, mirror where each one could have been, could have gone, or could go. For example, Miramatsu, he's the captain at the USP right now, and he could easily one day become the director of the USP Japanese division, like Ichitani. Or maybe at some point he begins to disagree with their philosophies and their policies and becomes more of a deserter like Dr. Yamamoto. They feel like real characters occupying a real world, well, real enough for Ultramans and Kaijus and whatnot. But they're interesting, they can be fun at times. At certain points in the book, I caught myself agreeing with one side and disagreeing with the other until another point was made where I would actually flip. And best part is there's more room to flesh them out in future stories. As far as the main story goes, I've already said it's an Ultraman story that feels like an Ultraman story. You got an alien coming down to Earth, bonding with a human, and boom, let's fight some monsters. But it is a little more complicated than that as here we have a book where the secrets of the USP start to kind of backfire as even their own members start to ask questions and even Shin Haeda, who was a bit of a purveyor of the USP at the start of the story, believing in it so much he was willing to lay his life down for it, but then starts to hear the facts come out and suddenly he's all like, okay, maybe they're not quite as trustworthy as I initially thought. It's especially jarring for Shin when he talks to Ichitani and Dr. Yamamoto and is told that the kaiju that the USP are quote unquote killing with these K-rays aren't actually killing the kaiju, they're just sending them to an alternate dimension. One that is over bloated, overstuffed, overfilled, there's too much water in the balloon and it's going to eventually burst. And this will not only free the kaiju that inhabit it, but it's also going to cause a lot of damage to the planet. This is why at the end of the book, it's decided to just destroy this dimension and free all the kaiju before it has a chance to blow up because at least if it's just kaiju being spread all over the planet, that's somewhat more manageable. And this part does bring me to one of the criticisms that I do have about the book, and that's the destruction of the dimension holding all the kaiju, which will make all the kaiju just spread all over the globe. Because one of the general plot points in this book was that the USP did everything in secret. They effectively were the men in black. Kaijus would show up, a USP organization would go out and deal with it, everything's kept under wraps, everything's a secret. Humanity doesn't have to know about it. Because as it's explained in the book, kaijus feed on fear. And naturally, a human facing down a giant, clawed, razor-sharp teethed monster would probably be very scared. However, Ultraman makes the decision that, no, I want the people to see me fight this kaiju uh, at the very end of the book. Because his thought process is, yes, they will be scared of the kaiju initially, but if they see me beat it, they would at least know that if something showed up, someone would be there to stop it. Basically ripping the band-aid off and showing to the world, yes, monsters are real, but 
so are heroes. And I thought that there would have been a sixth issue attached to this or a little side story in the back because we don't really get to see the world's reaction to this. And again, going back to destroying the dimension and releasing all the kaiju, at this point, I would think that world leaders and such would want to kind of come in on that decision as well. Because now you're going to have monsters popping up all over the world and a lot of these countries are going to be like, what, 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 what's going on now? Because really the decision as a whole fell primarily on Shin and the Ultra. Because Shin told Kiki, then Kiki and Shin went to go talk to Ichitani and then they just did it. Because yes, even though the book points out several times that the dimension is unstable, it's going to blow, there isn't an exact time given as to when this would occur. And to me, I thought that there was enough time for all of the USP organizations to make contact with their local government saying, hey, this is what we'd like to do, but because the kaiju could fall in your backyard, you know, you should have some say in the matter. Maybe there's some arguing, there's some panic, maybe there's this giant vote where, you know, half the country or half the world votes no and the other half votes yes. I mean, heck, maybe the world is on board and the governments work with their USP divisions if they have them and they start making preparations for when the kaiju start falling. But I will say that these lack of details may be just due to the fact that, again, this trade paperback comprises only five issues and we may get more of this in the next series. As far as the art itself goes, I love it. It's very classic Ultraman. I like the look of the cities. I think the panel layouts are great. The book has good flow and pacing. There's a lot of great standout splash pages in this book of Ultraman. And it's just overall really solid imagery. There's also some side stories in the back of this trade. One specifically that I want to focus on because we actually get Ichitani when he was still a field agent. This was a long time ago. He's out in France with his partner, tracking Kaiju that also happens to be the same Kaiju, but Mueller, that Ultraman fights at the end of this book. And this is also before the formation of the USP itself, so when they actually end up meeting some other Kaiju hunters, they kind of talk like, oh, hey, you know, this is our backyard, you guys don't have to be here, but, you know, Ichitani and his partner are like, oh, well, I mean, if we're not here, who else? And then after they supposedly deal with the kaiju, they start talking, it's like, you know, hey, why don't we just kind of form an organization here so we can kind of coordinate with each other a little better? What do you think? There's some talking, there's some laughter, yay, hell yeah, let's, let's just go get some drinks and stuff and, you know, let's have a good time and create a really cool organization. One girl's even like, yeah, I'll hang back and collect some evidence, make sure we didn't leave anything that any civilians could find. And everything's all well and good until she starts projecting a hologram of some alien entity that's kind of like static or, or something. And then someone she works with rolls up like, hey, I'm going to help you out. And she's like, oh, oh crap, this, no, that's not going to work. And, and yeah, she, she kills him. Blasts him with some eye beams because as it turns out, there's gonna be some infiltrating going on here and she's the infiltrator. And all I can say is, damn, I need to read Ultraman, The Trials of Ultraman. Because outside my one criticism that I had for this book, I had fun with it, I enjoyed it. This was everything I could want in an Ultraman story. Secret organizations, aliens, kaiju, Battles, explosions, Ultraman make cool poses. And I think if you like Ultraman, you're gonna like this book. If you want to try Ultraman, this is a good starting point. It's very accessible. And with that, I'm going to score Ultraman The Rise of Ultraman Volume 1 Trade Paperback a 9 out of 10. So Ultraman The Rise of Ultraman. Volume 1. What did you think about this book? If you've read it, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Please leave your comments in the comment section below. And if you liked this video, I'd love it if you'd smash that like button, share it with some friends, subscribe if you're not subscribed already, and ring that notification bell for more comic book content. And if you're wondering what to watch next, consider one of these two videos. Alright, take care, have a great day, and as always, stay geeky.